Roads? Oh, I'm well busy. Good morning, all. Well, another week, and a few more Democrats a answer the question about retirement. But this week was a little different. It's not just any other Democrat announcing retirement, it was a committee chair. Now, when I look in this room, a lot of you have been here for a long time. You know, it's different when a committee chair announces retirement. When Mr. DeFazio announced, and when you look at the um, rationale between he and the budget chair, they say the exact same thing I say. They're not going to be in the majority the next time. I can't blame him for announcing retirement, but he is now the 19th Democrat to announce retirement. Put that in perspective. In the year of 2010, when Democrats lost 63 seats, 17 Democrats announced retirement. They've already surpassed that. I don't know if we're allowed to bet, but I'll bet any of you lunch that number will be higher before the year ends or before the filing ends next year. Now, some of the rationale why they want to retire, it's just it's been disastrous Congress. What have they achieved? In the last 12 months, what have they been able to do with one party rule? Their $5 trillion socialist spending bill is unpopular with the American public. In fact, it is so unpopular, you don't have to take the Republicans' words for it. Just look to their own conference. Congresswoman Loria from Virginia, you know what she recently said? She admitted she even avoids bringing it up when she's back home. The leadership says they just need to get out and explain it more. And she says she avoids even talking about it. House Democrats, now they release their calendar for next year. Very exciting action taking place this week. They scheduled the least number of voting days in modern history. If you take next year and this year, it'll be 202 days. That's the least amount that we've been able to do in the last decade. When Republicans were in the majority, I think we were averaging about 250. Now, should we be upset about that or should we be relieved? If they're here less, maybe they could do less damage. Not sure. Now, when I look at President Biden and I look at his year of working with the Democrats with one party control, think about what they promised us. He promised he would shut down the virus and he hasn't. President Biden's only strategy so far has been to threaten Americans with more arbitrary COVID restrictions and mandates. He told his inflation would be temporary. Well, we realized that's not true. Just this week, the Federal Reserve Chair and Biden's own Treasury Secretary said that it was time to retire the word transitory. Chairman Powell could not even confirm whether consumer prices would even let up over the next year. I don't know what the press secretary is doing in the White House today, but maybe they're coming up with a new term to try to dismiss inflation concerns. After he said his policies... Um, after his policies caused gas prices to skyrocket, he said he would lower the gas price. He hasn't done it. He's even made it worse. And no, not the measly two cents the DCCC thinks is lowering it is a reduction. He depleted 50 million barrels of oil from our emergency supply and has done nothing to reverse this anti-American energy agenda that he has contributed to spike our costs. In my home state of California, you see the price rise almost every day, more than $5 a gallon. That hurts the hardworking Americans every single day. It's not just the gas price. If they take that, fill up the car and they go to the grocery store, it costs them more. If they turn on the heat, it costs them more. Everything they do. And now we've come to Christmas. We worry about the ability to even get the gifts you want or whether you could even afford them. But what's the answers that we get from the White House? can't even promise you that the Christmas gift will arrive on time, if you could even pay for it. The American people are fed up with this one-party rule and what has come of it in just one year. When Americans take the majority next year, we make this commitment to every single American. We will listen to you. We will hear you. We'll work on your policies, and we will improve your quality of life. With that, let's open it up for questions. I'm going to give it to you. Yeah, I was going to ask about the big fan of the answer about the government and the NBAA. I mean, is that, 
talk about you don't think that's a good option it sounds like and you, you think republicans would be opposed to this. yeah and I, I don't just think it's republicans it, it, jake's question is about adding the debt limit to the ndaa i don't think it would pass democrats can't pass the ndaa on their own um even in discussions with democrat staff they don't think they could pass it and so um Everybody looks to the fact, but let's go back on this question about the debt limit. It's another thing that we knew all along, when is it due? The Democrats have the ability of one party rule to get this done. They have the ability to get it done in the Senate without having any Republicans to do it. And what have they done to make it happen? Here we are on Friday and late last night, just government funding. We had to do it in the last minute to get something through. The management of this house is it's unbelievable in any shape and form. This, we knew this had to take place. And at the same time that it needs to take place, the Democrats want to add trillions of dollars. Why haven't they taken care of this? Why do they put the financial jeopardy of America on the line? I, I don't get it. Now they want to do some gimmick. I don't think anyone's going to abide by a gimmick. If they believe spending $5 trillion makes America stronger, they should vote for it. They have the ability to do it through reconciliation. The House would send it to the Senate. The Senate has the ability to pass it just on Democrat votes alone. The one-party rule, that's what they want. The one-party rule should deal with that. But I just don't think the NDA is one. I think, I think it would fail. I really do. Mr. Lager, yes, sir. Thank you. What, what is acceptable on the debt ceiling? We know how this gets to be political from time to time. But the issue is when we dealt with the debt ceiling at 11, there was the super committee. Of course, people can't brag about that. There was sequestration. There were questions about having other types of cuts, small budget deals, that Paul Ryan worked on. <clears throat> what is acceptable from Republicans if you were to enter into negotiations? With See, the everything you just talked about was doing a debt ceiling on a normal basis of a debt ceiling. This is different than any other course. Debt ceiling is coming before us at the same time you want to pass the largest bill in the history of America. You want to spend more money than America spent in World War II. So why do you want to raise the debt from that point? If that's what the Democrats want to do, it's their responsibility. If they, if they did not want to do reconciliation, I think people could find a course to be able to deal with the debt ceiling and put us on a path to balance the budget. So you're saying your side would if they were not doing the social spending, your side would be willing to engage on some sort we would of... Be in, we would, look, we'd be willing to engage and discuss on anything. doesn't mean we're going to come to an agreement, but here they are wanting to spend more money in history at one given time. They celebrate it. They all voted for it except one. I listened to them mock me on the floor that, yes, they elected this president to be FDR. And now that they have all the power and all the levers, they put America's financial economy in jeopardy because they won't even deal with the subject. If they believe in this bill, even though Loria doesn't want to talk about it, that's why you got to lift. But not to believe the point, I'm sorry here. Yeah. What, I, what I'm not understanding, though, I mean, do you have a plan? <laughs> Again, this was what happened in 2011. There were both sides said, okay, let's, not let's have the, a super not, committee. Not you, with, you, don't have something, you don't have some sort of a plan. Look, I, I would <laughs> lovely to sit down with, if you want to create a plan, you have, you sit down with the other side. And at every instance that you talked about, Republicans ha sat down and worked with Democrats on and worked with the Democrat president to actually curve the amount of spending we were doing, to make a decision to change the course of history. That's the opposite today. At no time of the history that you proposed when we talked about the debt ceiling was there a $5 trillion bill looming out there that you're going to have to raise the debt ceiling even greater for. If that is the case, the Democrats and their one-party rule want to do something different America has ever faced. Yes, ma'am. Um, are Marjorie Taylor Greene, Paul Gosar, and Lauren Boebert distractions to winning back the majority next year? Um, it's, it's things we would not want to deal with. It is, um, it is things that the American people want to focus on, stopping inflation, gas prices, and others, and anything that deviates from that causes problems. Yeah. Regarding uh, Representative Boebert's Islamophobic comments, um, are, why, why do you have such a hard time condemning something that is so clearly wrong? Let me be very I'm clear. I'm just speaking about this particular instance. Let me be very clear. This party is for anyone and everyone who craves freedom and supports religious liberty. Lauren Bulbert, as I called her, when it came forward, we talked. She apologized publicly. She apologized personally. I contacted Steny Hoyer 
and um, even talked about maybe Stinney and I should be in the room. We should lower the temperature of this Congress. We should work together and talk to one another. In disagreements and something goes astray, you apologize for it. Exactly what Lauren Boebert did. What's interesting to me, and I didn't get to watch Speaker Pelosi's press conference. Did any of you raise the question when someone on their side of the aisle said I work with the Ku Klux Klan, referring to Republicans? Did anyone on your side of the aisle talk about when Omar said the only reason I support Israel is about the Benjamins? I never got a public apology or a phone call. Or did anybody on your side of the aisle, I think you might have asked Speaker Pelosi about this one, when Congresswoman Omar referred to America and Taliban as equal, because I remember Speaker Pelosi saying something to the effect, and I could be wrong, but it was to the effect that she did not denounce her for saying that. So, I think when somebody does something that is wrong, they apologize. Lowen Bolbert apologized publicly and then picked up the phone and it took a lot of effort. She wanted to meet personally. Denied the ability to meet personally. When she picked up the phone and she called Congresswoman Omar, she said, I want to personally apologize to you. And that's what she did. I think in America, that's what we do. And then we move on on the issues that need to take place. Yes. Uh, Peter McCarthy, you previously, 2019, removed Steve King from his committees. How does this Lauren Boebert situation differ the nature of the inflammatory remarks from that situation. I think I just answered the question. She apologized publicly and she apologized personally. Yes. I wanted to talk about President Biden's vaccine mandates for businesses. Next week, senators are going to be possibly bringing a bill and uh, Manchin has already said that he would support it. Wanted to see if it, it does pass the Senate, what's the likelihood that you'd be able to get support to pass it here in the House? Well, the challenge is, is how you bring it up on the floor. We're not in the majority. We don't control it. Look, at, I believe in vaccines. I've been vaccinated. I actually took my booster shot on the night I gave a very long one minute. Um, I think right now what's ha having the effect by these mandates, though, is, is causing challenges to our firemen, to our health care system and others from the standpoint of it's becoming a job issue as well. Um, I know President Biden promised America that he could handle COVID. More people have died from COVID this year than last year. I watched the market this week tumble based upon the management that people have the trust in this president on how to handle it. I watched his only time that he moves back to, the, to some of the policies that he criticized President Trump about. From, from Mexico, staying in Mexico beforehand, to challenging on whether flights come into America. I think his mismanagement has only been on every single issue that he has dealt with, and it's sad. Yes, sir. Leader McCarthy, could you talk about some specific policies or bills that Republicans would pursue if you're in the majority? And the clashes that you've seen within your caucus earlier this week, if you're speaker, would that make it difficult for you to govern? Um, no, we're going to be quite fine. I've put in, we put every single member into seven different task forces. We've already laid out one, how to secure the border. We've laid out how to deal with China. We've laid out the Parents' Bill of Rights. We've laid out how to make America energy independent. That we rely on the precious minerals in America in an environmentally sound way. Um, we will continue to roll these out from health care to our freedoms and others. I just met yesterday with all the uh, task force chairs, and you'll see this coming shortly. If, if we are given the trust to be the majority, we will tackle inflation, we will secure our border, we will bring gasoline prices down, and we'll focus on the economy. An interesting fact that just came out last night from the Wall Street Journal, because I know the jobs report came out, and I'm sure the White House will try to spin it one way, but there were supposed to be 550,000 jobs, especially during a seasonal hiring period, much less than that. But here's an interesting fact. Wall Street Journal editorial board. There are about 4 million missing jobs since February 2020 in 23 states with Democratic governors versus 1.3 million in 27 states with GOP governors, even though there are only 15% more population 
Incredibly, the missing jobs in California, Illinois, New Jersey exceed all those in the 27 GOP-led states combined. It just shows you, from a fiscal standpoint, from an economic standpoint, even from a safety standpoint, the principles and the philosophies of listening to the American public. And no other time should America realize that more than just recently in the last election in Virginia. There is an opportunity here to make government more accountable, more efficient, and answer to the American public. Thank you all very much. I hope you have a great weekend.